Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Ad Espresso Office Hours. So I'm Paul and today we're going to be covering seven Facebook advertising tips if you're running an e-commerce business. Normally with the Ad Espresso Office Hours our format is a round table kind of interview or podcast style but we're going to change things up this week. It's just going to be myself and I'm going to be discussing some of the learnings from spending literally millions of dollars on Facebook ads for e-commerce. So I'm just going to give you seven quick tips on when you start out with e-commerce considering what's going to work and what's not going to work if you want to get into Facebook advertising to promote those products. So you can see the list here. I've come up with seven tips and let's dive straight into those. So the first tip that I think if you need to succeed with Facebook advertising for your e-commerce business is you need a distinctive standout product. So what do I mean by that? Uh, it's probably best to say what I don't mean by that, which is if you've got something like t-shirts or mobile phone cases that everybody's selling, then it's very hard to stand out in the marketplace. Remember, there's about 10 million advertisers on Facebook. So even if you've got a product that's slightly different, there could be thousands of people that are doing something similar. Drop shipping these days is extremely hard to work on Facebook. I've run ads for drop shippers before. Back in the day when Facebook, um, your cost per thousand impressions was very cheap, you could succeed just by getting those cheap clicks, those cheap distribution. Um, now you can buy the same sort of products on Amazon, eBay, all the other competitors out there, saying there's probably a thousand people just going to the same marketplace like Alibaba or wherever you're getting your drop shipping products from and competing against you. Um, also just competing purely on price is very difficult. It's going to be a race to the bottom against everybody else on Facebook ads. So think about building up the brand. Think of doing something a little bit different, a little bit distinctive there. It's a little bit more effort, but if you can stand out in the marketplace, that's how you're going to succeed long term. All of my clients that have really scaled their accounts and hung around, not just for a couple of months, but for multiple years, they've got their own standout products. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. Uh, Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls, they've had the two largest publishing campaigns on Kickstarter. They're a New York Times bestseller. How have they succeeded? The reason is that most uh, kids' books out there, if they've got any female characters in them at all, there's these weak princesses that are waiting for a prince to save them. Um, they're lucky if they get any speaking lines at all. Goodnight Stories is much more of a feminist angle. It's a hundred stories about real, empowering, extraordinary women. As it says there, you can see on the screen, they use 60 different female artists. So you've got that distinctive artwork as well. There's nothing generic about this book. It's not competing against any other book out there. This is why it's succeeded in the marketplace. Even though you can see there's quite a high price point there, $35. Um, another example here, this is a, a cake uh, making supplies client sugar and crumbs they're doing different icing sugars different flavored ones like salted caramel flavor icing sugar um, strawberry milkshake flavor lemon drizzle flavor to the best of my knowledge their market in the UK I don't have anybody else doing these flavors and certainly not an extensive range to go and make uh, you, your cake frosting with so just give you some random examples. You can apply that to just about any industry. How can you beat the competition? If they just did icing sugar, they'd be competing against every grocery store. So they've done flavored ones. Um, they're also kind of vegetarian, vegan, nut-free. They've got some extra angles there as well to stand out in the marketplace. So think what you can do there with your product. Second point here is you need to be owning your own assets, which is your website and your pixel. Um, if you don't have those, it's going to be very hard to succeed from an optimization point of view with Facebook ads. Once you've got the pixel on your website, some key benefits. I've got a webinar on this. You can what, go to adespresso.com forward slash webinars and see our pixel training. Um, but three key points here. You can optimize for purchases if you've got the pixel. If you don't optimize for purchases and just optimizing for clicks, you'll find your cost per purchase is about two and a half times higher. That means you would need to spend two and a half thousand dollars to get the same results as spending a thousand dollars. That's a huge difference. Next, you can do remarketing. You can also do email marketing, which we'll come to later. But just putting that pixel on the website, you can remarket those recent website visitors. Makes a huge difference because people don't always buy on first touch. You can also get tracking so you're not running blind. You can see how many purchases you get and how much revenue. So you can literally look at dollars in 
versus dollars out there. So these are the disadvantages with websites like Kickstarter, uh, Amazon, eBay, where you, you're not allowed to put the pixel, you don't own the assets, you're not going to get very good results. Um, you can use those as secondary marketplaces, by all means drive a lot of traffic through to your website. Some people will trust uh, Amazon more, they've got Amazon Prime accounts, yeah, put your products on there as well, but you need to be owning your own um, assets and driving the traffic there and being able to remarket them as the primary spend for your Facebook ads. Third point, and this is something I discuss a lot when clients are thinking about the products to sell, is there's something that I call the magic price point on Facebook. So it's where you don't want the, the price to be too high, but conversely, you don't want it to be too low either. Um, let's do some back of an envelope calculations. Now, don't quote me on these. Every product, every industry is going to be different. And this is also just looking at the US. Um, there are countries that are going to be a lot cheaper for distribution as well. Um, also, different seasons, like the holiday season, could be substantially higher. So don't quote me on these, but it gives you an idea. We need a starting point. So imagine that for a consumer uh, campaign for your e-commerce product, that CPM that costs per thousand impressions is $10. So a lot of times it's higher, sometimes lower, but let's assume $10. And then let's just put in for sake of argument, a $1, so a 1% click through rate on there. So 1% of those people that see your ads, click on it. That means your cost per click, our CPC is $1. So traffic through to your website requiring for a dollar. Now, let's put in another assumption. Let's assume that 5% of those people that reach your website there are going to convert and purchase. Um, so if it's $1 a click, 5% conversion rate, that gives us $20 per purchase. That's our CPA, which stands for cost per acquisition. So we can see that it's very hard to get under $20 as a bare bones minimum to acquire a new customer there. What that means for a price point is we can't go too cheaply. Um, sometimes we could be selling a a $10 phone case or a $5 ebook all day long, but we're not going to make some money from it because of the traffic costs these days. They are quite high on Facebook. Now, bear in mind as well with these figures that we only need some things to drop, like quite often we'll see a 2.5% conversion rate instead of 5%. That could be a $40 CPA. That's really common for a lot of my clients. Or maybe our conversion rate is 0.75% and so we're paying more like $1.25, $1.50 per click. Or maybe our CPM is $20. So we can see this, this CPA is definitely, you know, at the lower end there. So we can't be going too cheap with our products. On the other hand, we don't want to be going too high ticket, especially at first. The reason for this is, I would say once you get above, say, $50 per purchase, there's then a consideration phase. My magic price point is around about $40. $40 is high enough that if I'm paying $20 per acquisition, I've got some money there to go and pay for the product. Over $50, people then think, oh, should I wait to payday? Should I look at competitors? I'll go and ask my friends. I'll look at reviews. I'll go and look at their social media. Are they posting actively? Are they answering questions? It's a lot harder. We want what's called a one-click purchase at first. Around about $40, people see the product, fall in love with it. If you've got a good brand, they click through, they buy. Job done. And we get lots of data, so we can then get the sales coming in. We can then refine our strategy and improve over time. From those high ticket items is as we start going towards say $100, $200, it doesn't just get harder to go and sell, it gets exponentially harder. So we find that there's a real drop off in sales. Now I'm not saying you can't sell high ticket products, we can, but it needs a lot of branding, a lot of extra funnel steps, and you need to have a lot of testing in place there. So don't start out with that, otherwise you'll be pumping money into ads and not knowing what's working because you only get a handful of sales. If we can start off at say $40 per item, we should be getting enough sales to pay for the ads, but also enough data so that we can then start testing and refining our strategy. I do understand this isn't set in stone. Some industries, your products are cheaper or they are higher, but if you're starting with a blank sheet of paper and think about what products to sell, that magic price point, that one click purchase, but leaving some money in the pot there for ads is really gonna help you. We're halfway through now, so on to number four. We need to think about our average order value, which is AOV. As we saw for that original product that we sell, maybe it's around about $40. We want an easy purchase there, but we also need to 
increase the cart value there so we get a bit more money so we get some more profit to play with there and the way to do that is can we be doing bundles um this is man cave they do lots of toiletries in the uk i buy from them regularly i don't just buy one shower gel or one deodorant or one moisturizer i buy bundles so that's what we want to do is rather than just like one of these might be say uh five six pounds you know sort of ten dollars we really want to be getting uh, a bundle here you can you be doing upsells can you be doing cross sales are they be doing can you do accessories what i find is that people that just have one product even if it's a really good product hosted on your own website and the magic price point it's still hard to make money you need to be getting those uh upsells if you can be increasing your cart value by 50%, that means you can usually spend 50% more on the ads. That means you can really scale things, get more sales, and can make a, a really big difference to your ads there. So start off with that price point and then get those add-ons. We really want to be increasing that cart value as much as possible. And you'll find most products that you can do with this. If you haven't got a complimentary product, think about what accessories you can be adding there. And then another part of the calculation is once we get people to check out and we've got that high cart value, we need to get them to come back, which is our customer lifetime value or CLTV. Um, a little secret for you, a lot of e-commerce advertisers on Facebook don't make much money out for the first sale. The aim is really to break even and where you make the money is getting those organic repeat purchases there. Um, example for you, one of the largest Facebook advertisers in the UK is a brand called Huel. They sell meal replacements. You might have seen them. I think there's competitors in the US, things like Soylent. Um, we get these powders, you mix them up and you can have that instead of lunch. And where they make their money is that they do trial bundles. They don't make the money up front, but then people keep purchasing the product. They literally consume the product there. Um, I used to work in a bike shop and again another secret is bike stores don't make their money out of selling bicycles because you sell a bicycle yes it's a high ticket item but then the customers got that hopefully for several years where you make your money is selling energy bars energy gels clothing that they're constantly coming back and and purchasing you know oils for the chain tools things like that so you need to think about how you can get that customer lifetime value if you've got a product that's a single purchase it's going to be very hard to go and make it work long term because you break even on your first um, initial acquisition and then you don't get anything else so we need to think about how we can do that example here native deodorant they've got subscriptions um on instagram recently i've been scrolling through my feed and it's all toiletries it's all deodorants like i showed you the example before of man cave um you just constantly consume these products so you come back and buy more so that's the sort of thing that you've got to do with um on the flip side um Sometimes these mattress companies like in um, Europe, Casper did very well with their mattresses, got very good reviews, but they pulled out of the market in the EU because people would buy the mattress and then you've got it for probably like 10 years and they just can't get those repeat purchases. Whereas deodorant, much, much lower ticket sale, but you keep getting that repeat purchase. So it works a lot better there for e-commerce on Facebook. Nearly there now. Number six is use the generation that excuse the little typo there and email sequences so what i mean by that is we need to go and have a pop-up on our website and get people to give us their email address you could be giving a coupon code it could be an ebook um, or it could just be to enter a competition there but once we get that um, email we can put that into an automated welcome sequence that means we can then remarket to these people for as long as we want for free. So maybe they don't purchase straight away. Or if they do purchase, maybe we need to get them to come back as we just saw to get that customer lifetime value back. Don't just rely on Facebook ads. Facebook ads are expensive. You're gonna be leaving a lot of money on the table if you're not doing lead gen and automated email welcome sequences. The great thing about these is once you set them up, it's set and forget. So it doesn't take long, just head down, to spend a day getting your email sequences in place and you're gonna be generating extra revenue all along there. If you're just starting out, you need something um, quite basic, quite cheap. MailChimp is starting from free. I think most people have either tried or at least uh, are aware of MailChimp. If you're really getting into e-commerce, there's plenty of other CRMs out there. 
Um, good one is Clavio. I don't endorse any particular one, uh, but I find a lot of clients are using Clavio. It integrates very nicely with uh, Facebook to go and sync custom audiences. Also syncs really well with Shopify. So you'll find there's this kind of holy trinity of Clavio for email, Shopify for your e-commerce cart and Facebook for your social advertising. Saying there are other alternatives. I'm not wedded to any particular platform. Um, there is a downside to Clavio. It is quite expensive, which is why people normally start off on MailChimp and then start looking around at some of the other alternatives. Some people do stay with MailChimp, but certainly go and test out some other things out there. And then final tip for you is we want to be getting 100 purchases so that we can really access the most effective lookalike audiences there. Once you get those 100 purchases, then you can create what's where well, you can create normal purchase audiences if you get 180 purchases, sorry, 100 purchases within 180 days. But also, if you can get 100 purchases within 60 days, you access value based lookalikes. Value based lookalikes are fantastic. They look at the recency of purchase, the frequency of purchase, and the cart value. So they're really separating out the low value transactions from the best ones. So when you start off advertising your e commerce business on Facebook, Maybe results aren't great because you're having to rely on interest-based audiences or look like just off page fans or website visitors. My advice is, if at all possible, if the results are kind of okay, if you can just break even, stick at it. Try and drive through 100 purchases in 60 days to get to those value-based lookalikes. You'll then hopefully, fingers crossed, see a dramatic improvement in results. So don't call the um, you know don't call the ads too early. You need to be getting that data so Facebook can optimize and access the best audiences for you. So I hope those um, seven tips there are useful to consider what to go and advertise on Facebook for your e-commerce business. If you'd like some more help with this, I know there's quite a lot to take in. At Ad Espresso, we do offer some um, services. We're not just software. So we offer uh, campaign reviews. These are 10 minute tactical reviews, just checking your campaigns on the right track. And we also offer a one-to-one -one coaching service on either Facebook ads or Google ads. So you can actually speak with, with one of our experts to access that you can go to the services tab in Ad Espresso. We've also got free trials of Ad Espresso. If you just go to our website, you'll see the free trial uh, sign up there. And you might have some questions on this. If you've got any questions, then always feel free to reach out to me. As you've seen on any of the other slides, my email address is paul at adespresso.com and I promise to respond to every email. So any questions, any feedback, anything you'd like to see in future office hour sessions, please let me know there.